Hi, Islam. Sorry, I'm muted. Hi. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? Good. Good. How are you? Good. Haven't, haven't seen you in, in a while. No. Uh, are you in you, Cambridge? You yeah, I'm Cambridge. Do you go to campus okay. occasionally or? Um, yeah, when, when I have meetings with people. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've only recently started going sometimes, uh, also mostly for meetings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, you're, come, you're... I'll come say hi if you're in your office in Lyman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know if I'm if I'm there some days, and then we can. Yeah. Uh huh. For some reason, I thought have... you'd be go- you'd be gone off to uh, I don't know somewhere already. <laughs> uh, well, I uh, you mean uh, I, uh, I I mean I got uh, like a faculty position at Austin, but I'm starting next year. Oh, congrats! Uh, yeah, that's you. what I was. That's I thought I heard about that, but. Uh... Okay, so you start like in the spring. Or no, next I start in, in, in the fall, next fall. Okay, so I nice. still have one, one full year. Okay, so they let you extend? Yes, yes. That's nice. And you're, uh, you'll, you'll be here for one more year or? Uh... Only this semester, then I'll be at oh. KATP. Ah, oh, cool. Yep, but uh, uh... we'll definitely find some time to chat. Yeah, this would be nice. Let's uh, yeah, let's arrange something. Uh, I'll just uh, Cuban wanted me to send the PDF of my slide, so I'll I'll do so now. Okay, let's. Uh, also, well, this is, this also is just, an odd time. We can we can wait a few minutes for people yeah. to arrive. Also, just uh, send a reminder. Yeah, good idea. So. Uh, or they send so people will gradually join. Mm-hmm. And I'll be right back. By the way, Eslam, please feel free to share your your slide screen. Share, I'll share my screen now. Yeah, okay. Please. Yeah, please. Looks great. Thanks again. Maybe we may start. Um, sure. Yeah, we can begin. So, uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this special edition of the CMSA Quantum Matter Seminar. And let's give a warm welcome to Aslam Kalaf from Harvard University. He's here to tell us uh, about a strong coupling theory of magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. He's done a lot of great work on this topic, so we're very excited to hear from him. So thank you, Aslan. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so the, the purpose of today's talk uh, is to give a somewhat a pedagogical introduction to uh, a strong coupling theory uh, for the different correlated phases in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, 
so let me start by maybe very briefly re reviewing the, the basic physics of twisted bilayer graphene. So the main, uh, sorry. the main underlying uh, principle behind all of the special physics in twisted bilayer graphene uh, is the is the formation of a so-called uh, Mori super lattice, and the best way to illustrate what a Mori super lattice is to, is to just show it. So here I'm showing two, uh, two honeycomb lattices, two identical honeycomb lattices on top of each other. But you can think of it as any two identical lattices on top of each other, and I'm changing the twist angle between them. And as I do so, you can uh, notice the appearance of this pattern of uh, light spots that in this case also forms a honeycomb lattice. But the more, most important thing to take from this is that uh, the lattice constant of this new pattern is extremely sensitive to the twist angle. Actually, the, we can write an expression for the, this lattice constant as a function of the lattice constant of the underlying lattice. And you can see that particularly at very small angles, uh, this lattice constant can be very large, can be orders of magnitude larger than the lattice constant of the, of the system you start with. And this ability to tune the lattice constant continuously by, by changing the twist angle is essentially something that is unprecedented in a regular solid, where the lattice constant is just fixed. And this is the origin of all the interesting uh, and uh, all the interesting physics and magic in these systems. And the first people who realized that actually you can use this tunability to do something very interesting were uh, Bistris and McDonald, who in a seminal work in 2011, uh, essentially computed the band structure of this system as a function of the angle. And this is what they saw. Uh, they found that as you change the angle, you, you hit a very specific angle around one degree where a pair of bands become very flat. They almost have no dispersion. And they call this, uh, this special angle the magic angle. And uh, the, re the realization of this magic angle or the, the, the condition of this magic angle can be understood from a heuristic argument as the angle for which uh, the time it takes an electron to tunnel between the two layers uh, is roughly the same as the time it takes an electron to travel across a layer. So this time, uh, depends on the angle inversely because as you uh, as you change the uh, as you as you change the angle you change the period of this Mori pattern so the time it takes an electron to traverse one unit cell is strongly dependent on theta and at this magic angle you hit a, a resonance condition where these two times are equal and you get some interference effect that ends up quenching the kinetic energy so why is quenching kinetic energy important or interesting because when we quench the kinetic energy the uh, effects of interaction dominate. So the theoretical prediction would be that this system could have interesting interaction dominated physics at this particular angle. And uh, it took seven years for this prediction to be realized. And then finally in 2018, uh, a group at MIT led by Pablo Jario Herrero actually managed to make the system and they found a host of very interesting uh, correlation dominated phases. So what, what are these phases? So the first phase they found is a correlated, so-called correlated insulator. So correlated insulator is simply an insulator that cannot be explained by band theory. It has to be, it's an insulator that arises due to interactions. So what they did is they measured the conductance of this system as a function of the carrier density, which can be tuned by gate voltage. Uh, so what they found here and here are the cases where the band, the flat bands are completely empty or completely filled. So these are kind of simple to understand band insulators. However, they found that also when the flat band is partially filled, particularly at filling of minus half of half of electrons or half of holes or half of electrons, we also get some insulating behavior. And this behavior, because it's a, it, it appears at partial filling, it cannot be uh, simply a band insulator. It has to be due to correlation. Furthermore, when they consider the slightly uh, altered uh, experimental setting, setting to look for superconductivity, they actually found that these correlated insulators are flanked by two superconducting domes. Uh, so this discovery was now is by now more than three years ago. So let's see what we have learned since then about this system. So the first thing uh, we learned is that these correlated insulators have been by now reproduced in several systems, by, in, uh, in several samples by several experimental groups. 
Uh, and for example, this data is from the Barcelona group, from uh, Dima Efetov's group. And what we see, what they saw is essentially some resistive, highly resistive or insulating features as at most integer fillings. So notice here that people use different conventions of the filling. So in some cases, the empty band is minus one and the full band is plus one. But in some other cases, the empty band is minus four and the full band is plus four. That's because there is a spin and valley degeneracy in the system. So if you count in terms of individual electrons, uh, this, then you go from minus four to plus four. But if you count uh, not taking into account this degeneracy, then you go from minus one to plus one. But just the thing to take in mind is that this point and this point are the same. Um, so the the the... One issue is that the, the, these different experimental settings didn't all agree on which integers exactly show the insulating behavior. So for example, here there is a strong insulating peak at neutrality while not all other experiments see it. But the main robust finding is that there is a tendency for insulating or highly resistive states at integers and that the, particularly the insulators at half filling, at filling of two or minus two, seem to be the most robustly reproduced ones. Uh, next, a very interesting observation that wasn't seen in the original, uh, in the original work uh, is the observation that not only you get these types of correlated insulators, but you also get correlated topological or churn insulators. Uh, another name of these is quantum anomalous hole state. So these are states that has a quantized uh, anomalous hole conductance, uh, RXY. And this was first seen in an experiment uh, by uh, Andrea Young's group in Santa Barbara. So you can see here that this value of Rxy goes to this value, 25 kilo ohm, which is roughly uh, h over e squared. Uh, and this also have been by now reproduced in several samples by several groups. This is also the results from the Barcelona group. Uh, and furthermore, in uh, even in samples which do not show this behavior, uh, it was shown that by applying a small out-of-plane magnetic field, you can actually stabilize this, uh, this phase. So even if you cannot see this phase without magnetic field, you can apply a small magnetic field and, and observe it. So the observation of these uh, correlated churn insulators or quantum anomalous hole states, which are essentially analogs of uh, the quantum hole effect, but without a magnetic field, without explicit time reversal symmetry breaking, uh, is in a sense also a robust feature of, uh, of most of the samples. Uh, the third thing that also has been investigated by now by several groups is superconductivity. And although again, there is some sample to sample variations as to where exactly you find superconductivity, uh, there is some kind of consensus that you generically find superconductivity and that uh, the most robust superconductivity is found in the vicinity of this half filling insulator. Uh, in addition to these, there has been also a lot of other interesting observations that has been made at least in one sample, like uh, something called the strange metal phase, a phase which have a linear, uh, linear uh, temperature dependence of resistance. There's also observation of pneumaticity, spontaneous breaking of rotation symmetry, uh, of uh, charge density waves, and more recently of something uh, like uh, of fractional churn insulators at finite fields. But uh, I will, for my talk, I will mostly focus on the three main phases, which are the correlated insulators, the quantum anomalous hole states, and superconductivity, since these are basically the, the phases that has been most robustly reproduced and are seen essentially by everyone. And the main focus or the main goal of my talk or the, of the strong coupling theory is the following. So I have the system. Uh, which has several interesting phases. And uh, the question we want to ask is, uh, is there actually a unified framework to understand them or are there kind of independent manifestations of strong interaction? So my goal is to actually show you or to convince you that there exists a theoretical framework where we can actually understand all of these findings in a unified matter without, in, a, in a unified manner without really adding extra ingredients to explain each uh, individual phase. And to set the stage and maybe phrase the main questions, let me compare this system to one of the most studied strongly correlated systems uh, there is, which is the, the copper oxides, the cuprates, high temperature superconductors. And in particular, in the early days of the field, uh, we were making this comparison a lot just because of the fact that the phase diagrams 
are pretty similar. So we have a correlated insulator at some filling and then it's spanked by two superconducting domes. I will show you that this, uh, this comparison, that there is a lot of differences between these two systems, uh, but it's useful to have this comparison in mind just to set the stage for what type of questions we wanna answer about this system. So for example, when we think of this uh, cooperate system, uh, we first ask the question, what is the effective model for the low energy physics? And in these systems, these models usually take the form of a Hubbard or a TG model. So it's a model of electrons hopping on a, some square lattice subject to strong local interaction. Then the next question is, what is the energy scale responsible for superconductivity? And uh, in these systems, it's uh, the so-called super exchange scale. It's a scale associated with the antiferromagnetism. And it can be obtained in a perturbative expansion of the, uh, of the dispersion divided by the interaction. Uh, we can also ask what is the nature of the correlated insulator. And this is here well understood. It's a, uh, it's a mod insulating antiferromagnet. So uh, the, charge, uh, the charge degrees of freedom are gapped or quenched. And uh, we have local moments that are antiferromagnetically aligned. And also ask about superconducting mechanism, which uh, incorporates is still a controversial topic, but we can think that's roughly has something to do with the spin fluctuations or at least spin degrees of freedom in the system. And finally, we can ask, uh, ask uh, you know, what other systems can we generalize this behavior to? And of course, we can first start by considering different families of cooperates, but also recently people have discovered the, this uh, superconductivity in this new system, nickelates, which have some similarity to cooperates and was in a sense inspired by, by the discoveries in cooperates. So my goal in the talk is essentially to present this uh, unified framework for the different correlated phases and on the way answer all, fill, fill in all these question marks. And to begin with, let me start by uh, the, the by trying to understand the most basic thing about this system, which is its band structure. And this turns out somehow surprisingly to have uh, some very interesting and subtle features that that turn out to have very important implications for the interaction physics. So before introducing the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene, let me uh, introduce the band structure of graphene itself. So graphene, as we all know, consists of uh, of a sheet of carbon atoms arranged in honeycomb lattice. And this honeycomb lattice can be uh, subdivided into two sublattices called A and B that are denoted here by the blue and red colors. And uh, if you want to understand the electron motion in graphene, a very good uh, approximation is to think of the electron as hopping between nearest neighbors on this lattice. And the resulting uh, energy momentum dispersion is characterized by these uh, gap that's Dirac cone. We look inside the Brion zone, we find that there's actually two inequivalent points denoted by K and K prime. And these two points are related by some symmetry. Uh, the first is uh, C2 symmetry or 180 degree rotation. The symmetry actually exchanges the red and blue dots, but because they are identical, both are carbon atoms, this is a symmetry of the system. And this maps, this changes the momentum K to minus K, so it maps these two points. The second symmetry is, of course, time reversal symmetry. Time reversal symmetry also acts by flipping the direction of momentum. An important thing to note here is that if we combine uh, C2 on time reversal, we get a symmetry that is local in momentum. So it, uh, it, it leaves this point K invariant. And this symmetry is actually the symmetry that is responsible for the gaplessness of this point. Uh, it is the reason we cannot try a term that opens up a gap. And this is a symmetry that will play a very important role in our story. So now let's see what happens when we put two of these on top of each other. So here I'm just showing two, uh, two layers in momentum space. So the, the Dirac points at K and K prime sit right on top of each other. And then I start twisting. And when I do this, uh, the, these two Dirac points start getting displaced to each other. And at small angles, this actually leads to the appearance of a much smaller Brion zone, usually called mini Brion zone or Mori Brion zone. And we can understand the appearance of this brain zone simply by the fact that this twisting introduces a, a very long wavelength pattern in real space. It, it, it essentially enlarges the unit cell in real space and the, due to the reciprocal relationship between real space and momentum space, this was, would shrink the unit cell in momentum space. 
And if we are interested in low energy, we can just, in low energy physics, we can just focus on the energy momentum relation inside these two hexagons. And if we look inside one hexagon, we find exactly the version uh, I showed you earlier in the slides where we have uh, two flat bands. Can I ask a basic uh, question? Yeah. In this moiré pattern, um, do we really have uh, translation invariance or only it's like approximate? Yeah, it's approximate. So, so there, are, there is special angles where you could get a true translational symmetry, uh, but these angles become very dense. Uh, at small thetas, so to a good approximation, you think that you have a we have a transla true translation symmetry. I see. Thanks. But it, it's important to note here that this this band structure is actually the band structure for a single one of these. Uh, in order to describe the whole physics, we need to take into account these two. They are called the valleys. We also need to take into account the spin degrees of freedom. So in total, we have eight flat bands. And uh, as I showed you earlier in some of the plots, uh, we can denote their filling by a real number that goes from minus four to plus four. So minus four is completely empty and plus four is completely full. Some people use different convention where this goes from minus one to plus one, but for the rest of the talk, I'll just use this convention. Now, an important thing to note about this system is the following. Uh, there is a certain approximate uh, there is a certain hierarchy of scales that hold to a very good approximation, which is the fact that the bandwidth it's smaller than the interaction scale, which is smaller than the band gap to the remote band. So the bandwidth is uh, ranges between five to 15 MeV. The, the interaction scale is 15 to 35 MeV and the band gap is 35 to 50 MeV. Which means that to a good approximation, we can think of this problem by projecting out these remote bands and focusing on the flat bands and then taking this interaction, which is now strong uh, and projecting it onto these flat bands. So this problem of uh, strong interaction projected onto a set of flat bands is a relatively typical problem in condensed matter. And there is a typical approach people would use, which is to uh, take these two bands and build a, a real space lattice model. So the way you do it is that you take these wave functions and uh, uh, Fourier transform them to get a localized so-called Vanier, Vanier functions in real space. And then switch on hoppings between them to generate the to generate this dispersion, and then project the interaction onto this basis to get some lattice model which have both hoppings and interaction effects, like the Hubbard model. Now it was realized early on in the field that this actually doesn't work. Uh, if you want to faithfully represent all the symmetries of the system, you cannot write a lattice model. And uh, let me now explain actually why this is the case. This is one of the important features that, that is the reason why the physics of this system is not exactly the same as uh, the physics of other systems described by the Hubbard model like the Cooperates. So the main reason uh, that, or the main uh, underlying reason for this, uh, for, for this obstruction is the following. Uh, the symmetries we need to enforce or the symmetries that are needed to this argument are the following, the valid charge conservation and the, the C2T symmetry. So value charge conservation means that we wanna assume that if we are at low enough energies, the, these values are really decoupled and don't talk to each other. So if we think of a lattice model, we think of a lattice model that describes a single value. And the second symmetry we wanna impose or we wanna preserve is this combination of time reversal and, uh, and two-fold rotation. As I told you before, this symmetry is, uh, is local in momentum. So if we want to uh, consider the Hamiltonian for a single valley, uh, it's this symmetry, uh, which is local in momentum, but involves complex conjugation because of time reversal, impose, enforces the Hamiltonian to be real. So we can write the most general two by two real Hamiltonian uh, in this form. And then this, this first part is unimportant to the properties of wave functions. So we can usually drop it which tells us that the Hamiltonian can be essentially represented by a two component vector, uh, a two component real vector. And in this representation, the, the Dirac points uh, would appear as uh, vortices or anti-vortices. They are points where, the, where this vector vanishes and uh, where this vector has some winding around this point. And this winding can be positive or negative, which gives us some vorticity. Now, a relatively simple uh, thing that one can show is that uh, if, we, if you have any tight binding model, 
uh, with, uh, with local hoppings or short ranged hoppings, uh, the resulting H of K that you would get out of it would be smooth and periodic. This is essentially a statement that the Fourier transform of, uh, of a local function is smooth or of a smooth function is local, a smooth and periodic function. Uh, and if H of K is periodic and smooth, it implies that this vector cannot have a net winding around the Brion zone. If you go around the Brion zone, you'll find that the winding, the integral of the winding has to be zero, which tells us that the total vorticity has to vanish. And that's something we can see easily in graphene itself. So graphene has a tight binding model. And if we uh, plot this vector for graphene, we find that it has these two gapless points. And we find that one of them is a vortex in momentum space, one of them is an anti-vortex. Now let's see what happens if we do the same for twisted bilayer graphene. In twisted bilayer graphene, we have, two, we have two copies of this. We twist, and then we focus on one of the valleys. But now you see the problem, because if you focus on only one of the valleys, you get two points that have the same vorticity. So it's impossible actually to write a tight binding. You have a net, since you have a net vorticity here, it's impossible to write a tight binding model that uh, that actually captures uh, the tight binding model that properly captures the, the properties of this Hamilton. So of course the absence of, of a tight binding model or, or, or a real space model is a problem, basically because we are we're more used to handle interactions in real space uh, rather than momentum space. In fact, there is, I would say there is only one problem or one main system where that we know how to handle well, very well, uh, without a real space model in the limit of strong interactions, which is the quantum hole system. So this naturally leads to the question, can we maybe relate the system to, uh, to a quantum hole uh, problem? And at first glance, that's not obvious, but uh, there was a very uh, interesting uh, toy model that was discovered two years ago that actually hinted to an intimate relation between this system and quantum hole physics. So this toy model is called the chiral model. And to understand how it is defined, let's first, let me first introduce to you how do we describe uh, the low energy physics of twisted bilayer graphene. So we usually describe it using something called the Stritzer mcdonald model. We simply take uh, Dirac Hamiltonian for one graphene layer, Dirac Hamiltonian for the other graphene layer, and then couple them through to some tunneling. And this tunneling has some structure in real space that describes this Mori pattern, but it also has some structure in this uh, sublattice basis, in the AB sublattice. And this is something you can see from the fact that this Mori pattern, in some places it looks like it uh, has AA stacking. So A sublattice of one layer sits on top of A sublattice of the other. In some other places it has AB stacking. A sublattice of one sits on top of B sublattice of the other. In the original work by Bister Sir McDonald, they assumed that these two parameters, these two tunneling parameters for same sublattice and opposite sublattice are the same. But later on, it was realized that because there's slight differences in the energetics of these stackings, actually graphene likes to be AB stacked rather than AA stacked, you should actually consider two different uh, values of these amplitudes. And people have done some ab initio work to estimate these uh, parameters and found that this ratio between these two parameters ranges between 55 to 75 or 80%. So what Tarnopolsky and others did in this, uh, in this work about the chiral model was they assumed or they asked the question, what happens if I take this AA tunneling all the way to zero? It wasn't clear at the moment uh, how physically motivated this approximation is, but it turns out that this approximation yielded a model that has some very interesting properties. So it had a value, at least from a theoretical perspective. Although in the only last year, a very interesting work appeared that suggested that if you actually take this microscopic model and integrate out the bands gradually until you reach the flat bands, that this ratio tends to decrease along the RG flow. So even if you start from a relatively large value around 75%, the effective value for the low energy physics may be much smaller. So this model may not be as unrealistic as initially thought. But regardless of how realistic this model is, it turns out to have some very interesting properties, which I will, I will explain now. Uh, so first, let me uh, again write the Hamiltonian of this model. So this is very similar to the last slides, but I explicitly put in this AA tunneling term to be zero. So now you see that this uh, Mori hopping 
is, uh, is purely off diagonal in the sublattice basis. But you notice that also the full Hamiltonian is also off diagonal sublattice basis because this Dirac Hamiltonian is sigma x dx plus sigma y dy. So it doesn't have sigma zero or sigma z. So it's purely off diagonal. And what this tells us, it tells us that this Hamiltonian has a chiral symmetry. It anti commutes with the sublattice operator sigma z. Uh, another, very, the, another very interesting property of this Hamiltonian is that uh, it, uh, it hosts perfectly flat bands at some magic angles, some discrete set of magic angles. So these bands, unlike the, the, the realistic case where these bands are just very narrow, these bands are perfectly flat. So they are exact zero energy eigenstates. These two uh, observations together tell us uh, some, uh, a third very nice fact about this model, which is that uh, we can choose these uh, zero energy eigenstates to be also the, simultaneously the eigenstates of sigma z. So we can choose them to be sublattice polarized, to live entirely on sublattice A or sublattice B. Uh, it was already noted in the early work that the wave functions of these, uh, of these uh, flat bands, when we look at them in the sublattice basis, are very closely related to the quantum hole wave functions. And this observation that was made more, uh, more explicit uh, in, lately in, in a work by, by ourselves, uh, where we have shown that actually the way, not only they look similar to quantum hole wave functions, they're exactly equivalent to the wave functions of a Dirac particle moving in a non-uniform magnetic field. This non-uniform magnetic field has an average value of one uh, inside the, the Brion zone. And the main observation is that the uh, wave functions that are localized on sublattice A feel a positive magnetic field, positive net magnetic field, and the wave, uh, wave functions localized in sublattice B feel a negative magnetic field. So this already tells us that this problem is very closely related to the quantum hole problem. So what happens when we get back to the more realistic case where we actually do have some dispersion of the bands? Uh, typically, when you have some band structure like this, you may be tempted to label the, the states by their energy eigenvalue. But as I said in the last in the previous slide, the, the, there is this other basis that's inspired by the chiral model, where instead of labeling the states by their energy eigenvalues, we want to label them by the sublattice. And this is actually a different basis. It corresponds to some uh, linear combination of these energy eigenstates. And in this basis, we can also include the effect of the dispersion. So how does this dispersion appear in this basis? It actually appears as a, as a tunneling. So as tunneling between these sublattice A and sublattice B. So the important thing to notice is that this is an exact uh, equivalent or an exact mapping. We just have made a basis transformation such that the energy dispersion is off diagonal. Recall that you know the drug dispersion is sigma x kx plus sigma y ky. So if I go in a basis where the sublattice that is where the sub where I label the bands by their sublattice, then this dispersion would appear as a off diagonal term, as a tunneling term. Another advantage of this basis is that uh, the CQT symmetry is uh, manifestly implemented as a, as a, essentially a mapping between these two bands. So it guarantees that these two bands remain degenerate. You can see this from the fact that the twofold rotation sends sublattice A to sublattice B, and time reversal symmetry essentially flips the churn number or the, the direction of the magnetic field. So this tells us that we can exactly represent uh, the, the non-interacting physics or the band structure in terms of two flat bands that has opposite churn numbers or opposite magnetic fields that are connected by tunneling and are related by C2T symmetry. One aspect that may not be very obvious in this basis is the band topology, the fact that we have these two Dirac cones with the same chirality. And there's actually a very neat argument to understand it that was first uh, phrased in this work from Mike Zalatel's group, uh, which is the following. So let's take this system and think of this tunneling term as a term that creates a particle hole pair that live in the opposite churn sectors. We can perform an, an exact particle hole transformation in only one of the churn sectors. Uh, so this particle hole uh, term would become a particle particle term, so a Cooper, a Cooper pair creation term. And the churn number would also flip. So we get a Cooper pair in a churn band, essentially a Cooper pair in a magnetic field. And we know that if we have a superconductor in a magnetic field, it has to admit vortices. And because we, we are adding the churn number here and here, we actually get two vortices in the Brion zone that have the same vorticity. So this is the way to understand 
this fact that we have two Dirac cones which with the same chirality. So we have now found a way to rewrite the single particle physics to make all the properties we want manifest. So uh, we have the topology and the symmetry, and this is a basis that also makes the relation to the quantum hole physics manifest, which will be very important to us when we add interaction. So this leads us to the following minimal model for twisted bilayer graphene, uh, where we think of it as essentially four pairs of tunnel coupled opposite churn bands or quantum hole bands. Uh, and since this tunneling comes from the dispersion, we will assume that this tunneling strength is much smaller than the interaction. And of course, what I was doing was all applied for one flavor, so one valley and one spin. So in order to describe the whole physics, I need four of them. The, one of the main advantages of, of this basis, basis is that the, symmetries, the symmetry and topology are manifest. The important symmetries and the topology are manifest. And as I will show you now, this is a very good basis to, to, to handle interaction. But before doing this, I will uh, do a certain simplification, which is I will ignore the spin degree of freedom. So I will consider a spinless problem. Uh, this will not change any uh, of the qualitative features of the problem, but it will make the analysis a lot easier. And in our paper, of course, we consider the full spinful problem, uh, but here for simplicity, I'll focus on the spinless case. And one caveat when I consider the spinless case is the following. So for spin, we have a, an exact SU2 rotation symmetry, uh, but when we are in the spinless problem, we have two bands in each sector that we can still call them a pseudo spin variable. So this is, uh, so we call K, KB pseudo spin up and K prime A pseudo spin down. But this pseudo spin symmetry is not exact. Uh, we can show that in the chiral limit, this symmetry, this pseudo spin symmetry is exact. But if we deviate away from the chiral limit, we'll have small terms that break this SU2 pseudo spin symmetry. Uh, for most of my talk, I will assume that this uh, pseudo spin symmetry is a good symmetry. It's, it's a very, it's, it holds to a very good approximation. But in some parts of my talk, I will uh, get back to this point and discuss what will happen if you break the pseudo spin symmetry. Uh, so now we are finally at a stage where we can actually see what happens when we add interaction to the system. And to understand the effect of interaction, there is uh, actually another very similar, very related system where interactions are very well understood that I will now review or introduce. Uh, and by understanding the effect of interactions in this simplified system, we can understand, we can translate many of these insights to our system, to twisted bilayography. And that system is a quantum hole ferromagnet. So what is a quantum hole ferromagnet? Quantum hole ferromagnet is essentially realized if you take a Landau level uh, with spin degree of freedom, so spin for Landau level, but ignore the Zeeman splitting. So assume that these two levels are really uh, degenerate and you have SE2 spin rotation symmetry. So what is known is that if you add the repul any repulsive interaction to the system and you take half filling, so filling one of the two bands, uh, you can the, this uh, SU2 spin rotation symmetry is spontaneously broken and you get an exact ground state that's a ferromagnet. And you spontaneously develop a gap between these uh, two, uh, spin, uh, two spin bands and this gap is of the order of the interaction scale. There's a relatively simple way to understand this type of uh, uh, the emergence of these quantum hole ferromagnets, which uh, relies on Hund's rule. So if you remember Hund's rule from chemistry, it tells us that if we are trying to fill uh, some orbitals with some spins, we, we should choose the spin configuration that has the highest total spin. Because the, if the wave function is symmetric in spin, it will have to be anti-symmetric in orbital, and this would make it minimize the repulsion. Now, a very interesting aspect of uh, quantum hole ferromagnets is what happens when you dope them away from half filling. And this was something that was already realized in the 90s that uh, you can introduce charge in a quantum hole ferromagnet by forming a special uh, spin texture called skirmion. So, a skirmion is a texture that is shown here. Uh, I start with a ferromagnet where the spin is pointing downwards everywhere. And then I smoothly deform the texture such that the spin points upward at the point. And maybe a better way to visualize it is if we fold the plane onto a sphere. And in this case, this would be a, a texture where the, where the spin vector winds an integer num number of times around the sphere. And to understand why these textures in a, in a quantum hole ferromagnet actually carry charge, uh, consider the following thought experiment. Let's, let's take an electron and move it adiabatically through this Kermian texture. 
So locally, the electron will uh, will try to align its spin to the local spin, and this will, uh, as a result, it will acquire some Berry phase due to this pin rotation. And this Berry phase can be shown to be equivalent to the phase an electron acquires if it's moving uh, in through a some fictitious field where the flux is given by this expression. This expression is essentially related to the solid angle uh, on the Bloch sphere uh, spanned by this uh, spin configuration. Now, if we have a if we are in a churn band or in a quantum hole band, we know that there is a that there is this uh, strict relation between the flux and the charge. So you can think of it in terms of this churn Simon's flux attachment, where uh, if you have a flux, a local flux, then it will as be associated with a charge that's related to the churn number, according to this expression precisely. And this will tell us that this fermion texture will actually introduce uh, a local charge, the de uh, deviation from the background. And if we integrate this local charge, we'll actually get a, a total charge that's equal to the churn number times the winding number of this texture, which is always an integer. So not only are these uh, textures uh, charged in a quantum home ferromagnet, they actually turn out to be the cheapest charge excitation. So we can write uh, some kind of a field theory to describe uh, the energetics of the system. So we simply write the Lagrangian, uh, where we have here the very phase term for this uh, for these spins. We have here a gradient term, and we have here this term that tells us that actually skirmions are charged. So this is the the skirmion charge density, uh, the, the, the skirmion uh, density, uh, and it's coupled to the chemical potential with charge E. And here we have some long range part of the Coulomb interaction that also depends on the charge. If we ignore this last part, and we look at just this part of the, the Lagrangian, we essentially, the main energy contributions comes from the elastic energy. And uh, in a seminal work by Polyakov and Belavin in the 70s, they have shown that actually uh, uh, this elastic energy is bounded from below by the winding number of the skirmion. And they have constructed certain skirmion textures that actually saturate this bound. So there is a skirmion of minimum energy whose energy is four pi times this spin stiffness times the winding number. So if we take the, the skirmion that has the smallest charge, which has winding number one, we can measure their energy, just four pi rho. And in a quantum hole ferromagnet with Coulomb interaction, it turns out that this value is actually exactly one half the energy of, an elect of adding an electron with the opposite spin to the system. So if we want to dope a quantum hole ferromagnet, the cheapest way to do it, the energetically cheapest way to do it is actually by forming a skirmion rather than by adding an electron. And with these insights, or with this quick review of quantum hole ferromagnetism, let me get back to twisted bilayer graphene and see uh, what are imp the implications of this for twisted bilayer graphene. So first, let me try to explain uh, the emergence of correlated insulators in twisted bilayer graphene. So we can start by uh, neglecting the tunneling between the churn sector. So then now our problem becomes precisely uh, two quantum hole ferromagnets that are completely decoupled that has opposite churn number. And here we can apply very similar reasoning to the case of, uh, of quantum hole ferromagnetism. But since maybe there is a, it's, it's less intuitive, the problem is less intuitive in this case, let me present a bit more rigorous argument for how to obtain the ground state. So we can write the, the interacting Hamiltonian in this form. So this is just a Coulomb interaction or some screened Coulomb interaction. So this is a density-density interaction where the density is measured relative to some reference filling. And where the wave functions of these uh, flat bands are encoded through this uh, form factor. This is a, a matrix that basically looks at overlaps of wave functions of different momenta. And if this interaction is repulsive, then it's, it's, uh, then this Hamiltonian is non-negative definite. So it's easy to show that a sufficient condition for a state to be a ground state is that it is annihilated by all of these uh, density operators. So if it's annihilated by this density for all Q, this is an exact ground state. Now, another thing to notice about this system is that because the churn sectors are decoupled and because we have SU2 spin, we have spin and charge conservation in each sector, we have a total, a, a large symmetry group, which is U2 times U2. And the implication of this is that this uh, density operator is actually diagonal in both the churn and spin indices, which means that uh, instead of looking at this full symmetry operator, we can look at states that are annihilated by these uh, density operators in each band separately, in each spin and in each uh, churn sector separately. 
And if we look at a single band, it's very easy to find uh, to find states that are annihilated by the density operator. The density operator looks like hopping in momentum space. So if we have a band that's completely empty or this is completely full, we find that the density operator really vanishes there. So our so we find we end up finding a a large family of ground states obtained by taking uh, this ba uh, these bands and arbitrarily filling a subset of them and leaving the, the remaining subset empty. And of course, since we have this large symmetry, we can start from any of these states and act with this symmetry and get a family of ground states. So when we, when we think of twisted bilayer graphene, uh, we have the following. If we are, for example, at odd filling, we find that we can, for example, fill one out of four or three out of four, but it's easy to see that in all of these cases, we will have a net churn number. So we end up automatically, in this case, getting a quantum anomalous whole state as the ground state of our system. On the other hand, if we're at even filling, uh, we have two options. We can fill both bands in one churn sector to get, again, a quantum anomalous whole state, or we can fill one band here and one band there, so to get a churn zero state. This is already tells us that within this formalism, we can uh, get both quantum anomalous whole states or states that has finite churn number, but also states that has a zero churn number, particularly at even filling. Uh, a, a very important configuration is this one. So it's half filling uh, churn zero configuration because uh, this would be the parent state for the superconductor because you know if the parent state strongly breaks time reversal symmetry, you cannot really get a superconductor. So let's try to understand this phase more. So here we fill one band in this sector and one band in the other sector. And we have a choice not only to choose the lower band or the upper band, but we can choose any linear superposition. So this freedom is actually parameterized by two unit vectors. So we have a continuous manifold of ground states that is essentially equivalent to a product of two spheres. Uh, of course, these states, all of these states are exactly degenerate on the level of interaction only, but now we need to add small perturbations to lift this degeneracy. And the first perturbation we want to add is the dispersion. So the dispersion, as I said, acts as tunneling between these two turn sectors, and we can understand the, its effect by uh, looking at the following uh, uh, cases. So if the dispersion connects two empty bands, it does nothing, because there's essentially nothing that tunnels. Uh, there's no particles to tunnel. If the dispersion connects two fully filled bands, there's also nothing to tunnel, uh, or there's no place for the electrons to tunnel, so the only case where we have an effect of the dispersion if it connects a uh, fully full to a fully empty band. And if we take uh, this tunneling into account perturbatively, because we are assuming the dispersion is much smaller than the interaction scale, then we can understand this effect uh, as a virtual process where an electron tunnels and then comes back and in the process gains energy. We can actually compute this energy uh, gain uh, in second order per perturbation theory. Uh, as follows, we act with this tunneling uh, matrix elements to generate the particle hole excitations. Then we define the particle hole Hamiltonian. And there's actually a subtle argument related to topology that shows that the Hamiltonian is always gapped. So it allows us to actually do perturbation theory uh, and find the leading order perturbation which has this, has this form. Notice that this is, I'm using here a very compact notation. So these H's are like vectors in momentum space. And this uh, capital H is a matrix in momentum space. So, and this is a matrix equation. And the result of this calculation is, uh, is this uh, scale J that looks very similar to the super exchange in, in the Hubbard model, for example. And it's of the order of 0.5 to 1 MeV. And it will turn out that actually this is a scale relevant for superconductivity. And to understand actually what this, uh, what this effect is, uh, let's look at this special configuration where we are at half filling for the churn zero states. So we fill one state on one churn sector and one, one band in one churn sector and one band in the other churn sector. We see that uh, this corresponds essentially to an antiferromagnetic coupling. So if, if the spins are aligned in the two sectors or these pseudo spins are aligned, then this tunneling term is, uh, is completely blocked and we don't get an energy contribution. On the other hand, if they are anti-aligned, we get this energetic gain, this antiferromagnetic coupling, which tells us something interesting about the system that we have a ferromagnetism within each churn sector, but antiferromagnetism between churn sectors, which kind of makes it somewhere in between like quantum hole uh, systems, which are ferromagnets and uh, 
Hubbard systems, which tend to be antiferromagnetic. So this is not the only perturbation we can add, although it's the leading one. So there's, there's other perturbations we can add in order to really lift all the degeneracies between the different ground states. And uh, although I will not go uh, into the, the details of these anisotropies or the perturbations, uh, what I want to say is that uh, the main conclusion of this calculation is the following, that at even fillings, uh, we find the ground state that is a coherent superposition of the two valleys. So it spontaneously breaks this uh, valley charge conservation, so-called intervalley coherent state. But most importantly, at even fillings, the ground state has a zero churn number. So it's a... Uh, it's a, correlated in, it's a correlated insulator that doesn't have a churn number. While at odd fillings, we have a ground state that has an odd churn number. So it's a quantum anomalous odd fillings. And that already tells us or explains this dichotomy seen in experiments where, for example, at nu equals two, we get uh, correlated insulators, but at one and three, we sometimes get these uh, correlated churn insulators or quantum anomalous odd states. There's one further uh, implications of this analysis, which is that we have, it's not that only we have this brown state, but we have actually a large manifold of low lying states. And this means that by applying a small perturbation, we can actually select a different state from this manifold. And one such perturbation is magnetic field. So we can apply out of plane magnetic field. And what this does is the following. So the out of plane magnetic field uh, introduced some orbital coupling that would actually reduce the energy of some of the churn plus bands compared to the churn minus bands. Uh, and this would select the state that has the maximal churn number. So you want to fill, let's say, churn plus first before filling the churn minus. And this will tell us that if we apply a magnetic field, we'll actually select a different ground state whose churn number is given by this expression, four minus the filling. So depending on the filling, for example, if we're at filling uh, four out of eight, so nu equals zero, then we get four because we fill four in one churn sector. If we're at filling five, so this is nu equals one, we get, uh, we get a churn number three, et cetera. And this was indeed verified experimentally. So people, uh, several experimental groups now have done these experiments where they apply a magnetic field and plot these type of uh, diagrams called Landau fans. Uh, the main thing to learn from this diagram is that if you have a feature, this corresponds to some insulator. Uh, and the slope of this insulator with magnetic field gives you the churn number. So if it just goes up straight, this is a churn zero state. So this is, again, as you see at an even filling, you get a just a churn insulator, uh, no, no, uh, a correlated insulator that has zero churn number. But as you can see at finite fields, you always get these sloping curves whose slope follows precisely this expression. At zero, you get a slope of four. At one, you get a slope of three. At two, you get two. And at three or minus three, you get one. So I've shown you already that this form, uh, formalism uh, captures both the standard correlated insulator and also the topological or churn correlated insulators. Next, I would like to uh, explain the superconductivity, which is maybe the most, uh, the most tricky one to explain. And at first glance, it doesn't seem very obvious how this would work because you know, we have an analog of correlated insulators and this quantum hole ferromagnet, but it's not clear what in the quantum hole problem would correspond to superconductivity because quantum hole systems strongly break time reversal and they never become superconductive. So what I will show you now is that there's a surprise. And the surprise is that this, this, uh, this formalism gives you superconductivity essentially for free. You don't, you don't need any extra ingredient to get superconductivity. And the idea is built again on this observation that uh, there is a, a total weight at charge into a topological band or a quantum hole ferromagnet, which is to form these skirmions. And uh, I showed you that in a quantum hole ferromagnet, the skirmions are the energetically cheapest excitation. Uh, this turns out to be uh, approximately true in twisted by the graphene, although it depends a bit on the parameters. So if we're so here, I'm computing the the ratio of the skirmion energy versus the single particle energy. And if we're close to the chiral limit, and this is a function of, energy, of angle, if we're close to the chiral limit, then uh, this ratio is very close to one half, which is the value for uh, we get in quantum hole systems. But even if we're very far from the chiral limit, like this is 75%, which is the largest possible value for this ratio, the skirmions are still the cheapest excitations, but not by much. 
So in the following, I will basically assume that the skirmions are the cheapest excitation and uh, try to understand what are the implications of this. So if we want to add charge to twisted bilayer graphene as skirmions, uh, we have two options. Since we have two churn sectors, we can add this charge as a skirmion in the plus churn sector or as an anti-skirmion in the minus churn sector. Recall that the charge is equal to the churn number times the winding number. This winding number is odd under N. So if we flip all the spins going from a skirmion to anti-skirmion, uh, we end up flipping the winding number. But since we go from a plus churn band to a minus churn band, uh, we have an extra minus sign. So these two textures will have the same charge. Now, once we couple these two sectors, the main surprise is that because of this antiferromagnetic coupling, these two textures, although they have the same charge, they will attract. That's something that can be uh, seen uh, very clearly by uh, looking from the side. So rather than just looking at this very complicated texture, let's, let's have a side, a side view and look at the skirmions from the side. So you see if the two skirmions sit right on top of each other. Then these spins in the two uh, churn uh, layers or in the two churn sectors are exactly anti-aligned everywhere. So this antiferromagnetic coupling term is very happy. On the other hand, once you start displacing the skirmions from each other, you'll get a large region of space where the, these uh, spins are not exactly anti-aligned. And as a result, particularly if you think of large skirmions, this will give you an energy cost that grows uh, as J times the, the separation between the skirmion square. So it grows very rapidly with the, with the distance between skirmions. And notice that this, this contribution would always win over the Coulomb repulsion between the, the skirmions because they, have, they still have similar charge. So there would be a one over R Coulomb repulsion. So this tells us essentially that no matter how small this J is, at long distances, uh, we prefer to pair these skirmions or for large skirmions, we prefer to, uh, to pair them to make them sit on top of each other rather than having them far, far apart from each other. Which tells us essentially that we get a charge to E bound state, a state that has the same charge as a Cooper pair. And of course, this state is bosonic. So we have already the main ingredient for superconductivity without really adding any extra ingredient to this system. Of course, having a charge to E. Uh, are there some questions? Um, okay, so of course, a charge to E bound state is not sufficient to establish superconductivity. We still need these uh, bound states to condense. And uh, to understand their condensation, we need to uh, understand, uh, to estimate the effective mass of this bound state. And there is a relatively neat argument to do this, which is, uh, by thinking of these two objects as connected by some spring force, because you know uh, spring force has a potential and energy that grows quadratically in the separation. So this is really very similar to a spring force. And we think of what happens when this object starts moving. So the skirmions and anti-skirmions in opposite churn sectors feel opposite effective magnetic fields, but they have the same charge, which means that they feel opposite Lorentz force when they start moving. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this, so this Rollins force will, will try to pull them apart, but uh, due to this spring force, I will have a restoring force that tries to bring them back together. And I can equate these two with each other. And from this, I can read off the energy at finite velocity that's uh, quadratic in the velocity. And from this expression, I can estimate the mass of this object, which turns out to be inversely pro proportional to this J. And from the mass, I can uh, I can e essentially estimate the stiffness that gives me a, a, a costarly style tr uh, transition temperature, which is given by this simple expression. It's just uh, the doping, the density of skirmions times this J parameter, this antiferromagnetic uh, coupling. And if I substitute the numbers, I get the right scale for superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene. So this is in a sense a remarkable uh, result because it tells us that uh, we, we have found a new mechanism of super, for superconductivity from purely repulsive interaction that relies in, in this fundamental way on uh, the band topology of the system, on the fact that we have, uh, we can decompose the band structure into a plus, a plus churn band and minus churn band or plus magnetic field and minus magnetic field. Uh, 
Um, of course, this is a kind of a semi-classical picture. So to make this more precise, we actually need to develop a, a proper quantum theory. And uh, such theory would be based on the field theory for a quantum hole ferromagnet uh, introduced earlier. Essentially, what we do is we introduce uh, this uh, field theory for uh, a quantum hole ferromagnet with opposite fields in the two opposite sectors. Then we couple these sectors antiferromagnetically. So we integrate, we integrate out the ferromagnetic fluctuations. Then we get a sigma model in a single n vector. Uh, but it's important to note here that in this, uh, in this sigma model, we have a coupling to the chemical potential with a prefactor two, because the skirmion in n is at the same time as skirmion in n plus and an anti-skirmion n minus. This is already a bound state of a skirmion anti skirmion pair. So it has a charge two. Now to understand the, this model, we go to something called CP1 representation. So instead of uh, a real three-dimensional vector, we introduce uh, a two-component complex unit vector. And this representation has a gauge redundancy because the phase of Z drops out from this. And this is captured by introducing some dynamical U1 gauge field. And the resulting Lagrangian has the following form. So it's, uh, it's this uh, bosonic component boson coupled to, uh, to this dynamical U1 gauge field. But more importantly, the, the skirmion charge translates to the flux of this dynamical gauge field A. So the coupling to the chemical potential now takes the form of a churn simons couple, a mutual churn simons term with the background field. And again, we have this factor of two here that tells us that uh, skirmion, which is a two pi flux of A, carries charge two. Now, this is a theory of bosons, so we can look for uh, its ordered or disordered phases. So the ordered phase would simply be a phase where Z is condensed and uh, A is higged. So this would be an insulator. And the disordered phase would be a phase where Z is gapped and A is in the Coulomb phase. And in this case, we can integrate out Z and get to a dual theory of a complex boson coupled to the background field with charge two. So that's precisely a theory for superconductor. So this tells us that actually, there's a theory that captures both the insulator and the superconductor. And uh, you can get a quantitative phase diagram from the out of this theory if you go to the large n limit of the CP1 theory. So go to CPN, make this an n component vector. Uh, and uh, I will not show the details of the phase diagram, but uh, I will just show the final result, which is you can extract the uh, BKT transition temperature that's given by this expression, which uh, apart from the numerical prefactors has the precise dependence I showed earlier. So it's proportional to the density of skirmions times J. An independent verification of this mechanism came from a very beautiful numerical work from uh, Mike Zalatel's group. Uh, what they did is that they did the DMRG simulation for a model of two uh, quantum hole ferromagnets that are antiferromagnetically coupled, that are in opposite field and are antiferromagnetically coupled. And one thing that they considered that I haven't discussed and uh, I haven't discussed so far is uh, the effect of this breaking of SU2 pseudo spin rotation symmetry. So as I said, the spin we're not th thinking here about real spins; we're thinking about pseudo spins. So so spin rotation symmetry is not perfect. It's broken by small terms. And these terms take the form actually of easy plane anisotropy. So the spins like to be in plane rather than out of plane. And uh, they introduced this by uh, considering this parameter lambda, which measures this, uh, the value of this anisotropy. And they actually consider both negative and positive values, but the physically relevant case is, is positive lambda. And this is the phase diagram they, they all see. So there is several interesting observations we can see from here. So first, so this is these dark spots are just the, kind of the order parameter of superconductivity. Uh, the first thing we see is that when lambda is zero, we actually get superconductivity no matter how small j is. So this uh, agrees with what I told you earlier that we get this uh, this binding and this condensation of skirmions essentially regardless of how small this j is compared to the Coulomb interaction. Uh, second, we see that although this lambda is bad for superconductivity, the, the physically realistic lambda, which is a positive one, uh, is much uh, less, less destructive to superconductivity compared to uh, easy axis anisotropy. So we are, we are physically expected to be here. So for the physical regime, we don't expect superconductivity to be, to be destroyed by this uh, easy plane anisotropy. And the reason essentially is that the skirmions can deform into a, a topologically equivalent texture called a tomb of 
two, two textures called merons, which are like vortices. And uh, this way they minimize this, uh, this anisotropy energy. But the third thing they noticed is that the phase boundary at which you lose superconductivity roughly coincides with the phase boundary uh, at which you lose the, the pairing of skirmion and the sigma model, which tells you that this superconductivity is really due to skirmion pairing. So that's one uh, very uh, nice independent verification of this mechanism. But of course, it's, uh, it's, it's good or it's better to also uh, have verifications from experiments or at least have some predictions about experiments that are unique to this mechanism. And one of these predictions we can make is the following. So this mechanism relies on very specific ingredients. In particular, we need flat bands, we need specific band topology, and we need specific symmetries. And we can think of ways to verify this mechanism by simply trying to remove one of these, uh, one of these requirements and seeing if superconductivity is gone. So one of the easiest uh, requirements to actually violate is, uh, it's, is this uh, C2T symmetry. So uh, if we break C2T symmetry, the, 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 this spoils uh, our mechanism for two reasons. The first one is that C2T symmetry was what guaranteed that these two bands were degenerate and energetically degenerate. So this tunneling was resonant and gave us a relatively large value for this antiferromagnetic coupling G. But once, uh, if we add a perturbation that shifts these in energy, then we will suppress this parameter. The other thing is that Perturbations that break C2T symmetry essentially introduce some Zeeman coupling for the quantum hole ferromagnet problem. And this is known to be very bad for skirmion energetics. Uh, so our prediction is that if you strongly break C2T symmetry, you destroy or at least weaken superconductivity. Of course, time reversal symmetry, we can break it by magnetic field, but it's but generally breaking time reversal symmetry destroys superconductivity. So that wouldn't be a very unique prediction for our mechanism. But if you look at C2, there is no reason a priori why breaking C2, why superconductivity should be too sensitive to this symmetry. So that's what we should try. And experimentally, this uh, can be done by placing, by aligning the twisted bilayer graphene on top of the hexagonal boron nitride substrate. So this hexagonal boron nitride is, uh, is a material that has the same lattice, roughly the same uh, uh, honeycomb lattice as graphene. But instead of just having uh, graphene atoms on, on both A and B sub lattices, here you have boron atoms on A and a nitrogen, nitrogen atoms on B. So A and B sub lattices are very different. So it introduces a potential that distinguishes A from B, which breaks this twofold rotation symmetry. And indeed, there has, be, there has been a few samples that were, uh, that were considered in literature, which have this feature. It turns out actually that this thing helps observe the quantum anomalous whole states. But another feature of these samples is that none of them showed superconductive. So this is one of the things that, at least for the range of samples uh, we have, seems to be reliable. When you align with hexagonal boron nitride, you lose superconductivity. Another thing is you can just look for other Mori systems, which share the fact that they have flat bands, but don't have these precise symmetries, uh, this precise symmetry. And examples of these include the whole double bilayer graphene, if we just take two layers on top of two layers, or mono bi, which we take one layer on top of two layers with a twist. And also these systems, uh, show either no superconductivity or very weak superconductivity. But of course, all these predictions are kind of negative predictions. It tells you when you do not get superconductivity. So it would also be good if we can predict when you can get superconductivity. So can we use this, this criteria to get uh, to predict new superconductors? The answer is, is yes. There's actually a class of systems that satisfy all the, all the conditions that we identified in twisted bilayer graphene to realize the superconductivity. And this, this is a class that we introduced some time, uh, some time ago. It's uh, uh, called alternating twist multilayer graphene, which is it defined uh, as follows. So you can take any number of layers. But the main defining feature is that you choose the twist angle to be alternating. So theta minus theta, theta minus theta. As long, I think there's a question. Uh huh. Uh, may, may I ask what actually happens in experiment in a magnetic field and whether you predict uh, a different behavior of uh, TC versus H compared to conventional means, conventional pairing? 
uh, for out of plane magnetic field, this uh, this uh, this superconductor will be de will be destroyed because of because uh, yeah, as, as I said, there is a Zeeman for in plane for in plane magnetic field. Have similar parameters as conventional, and the parameters quite different here. Uh, yes, I think that the 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 parameter here for out of plane magnet so so. So the superconductor will be destroyed in out-of-plane magnetic field by mostly by orbital effects rather than Zeeman effects. So the the the, the parameters will be different. It depends on the value of the orbital g factor. I don't know exactly uh, at the top of my head what this what this value is. How does uh, the London penetration depth behave for your skirmion superconductor? For example. Um, That is a good question. I know that the coherence length will be large, uh, no, will be, uh, no, no, small. So of the order of the interparticle distance. Uh, the London penetration depth, uh, well, these are 2D superconductors. So there is already, uh, it's tricky to, uh, to measure the London penetration depth. Uh, and yeah, so I, I don't know uh, what exactly will be the, the 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 behavior of the London penetration depth, okay. how different how different it is in this in this system compared to a BCS uh, a BCS case. One can measure superfluid stiffness, I'm sure. Experiment. Yes, yes, one can measure superfluid stiffness. Um, but so you're asking about our prediction of. The dependence of superfluid stiffness on magnetic field, yes, which is related to London penetration. So, so okay, so so so. So the question is, how would the superfluid stiffness behave in magnetic field? Or just at small magnetic field as a function of temperature? Is it similar to conventional superconductivity? Are the parameters completely different? Um. I think it's a very good question, but I don't know the answer uh, okay. immediately. Wow. I'd need to. Something to think about. Okay. Yeah, Thank something you. to think about. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 this alternating twist, uh, these alternating twist multilayer graphene systems have some very uh, uh, interesting property, which is their, that their non-interacting physics maps exactly to uh, to decouple twisted bilayer graphenes. So if we take an odd number of layers, n plus one, then on the non-interacting level, it maps to a single Dirac cone plus uh, n copies of twisted bilayer graphene with the caveat that uh, the interlayer uh, tunneling gets modified for these, uh, for these copies of twisted bilayer graphene. And a very similar statement happens also for an even number of layers. If we have to n, it maps to n copies. So if you take the simplest case, which is a tri-layer, uh, we find that this actually maps to a uh, twisted bilayer graphene where the uh, interlayer tunneling is rescaled by factor of root two plus a single Dirac, uh, but plus a single Dirac layer. And the main implication of this is that uh, we get the same magic angle behavior, but the magic angle is rescaled by factor of root two. The band structure is also very similar to twisted bilayer graphene with the main difference is that we get this extra Dirac cone and not only the band structure is identical, but also the wave function map exactly to those of the bilayer graphene, again, with this extra Dirac cone. Uh, so this led, led us to predict that this system is actually a very promising candidate to realize superconductivity. It has all the uh, properties that are realized in twisted bilayer graphene, uh, the band structure, the symmetries, and so on. And uh, this prediction was indeed verified by experimentalists, both uh, Pablo Herrero's group at MIT and, uh, and uh, Philip Kim's group at Harvard. So what they saw is that, uh, uh, the, so this is the data from the MIT group, this is the data from Harvard group. They found superconductivity at the TC that's around 2.5K. So roughly square root of two larger than the TC found in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, one advantage of the system over twisted bilayer graphene is that its behavior can be tuned by electric field, which is shown here in this figure. So this is electric field. And you see that the superconducting regions change a bit and grow. Um, another observation, which 
may or may not be very relevant is that uh, in the underdog regime, uh, it seems that the PC is uh, kind of limited by doping, roughly proportional to the doping. And this ends towards kind of a BEC type scenario where the limiting factor for superconductivity is the total number of carriers rather than the carriers just close to the Fermi energy. And that's compatible with uh, with the formula I wrote for skirmion superconductivity. Um, another thing that uh, seems to be special about the system is that there is some evidence of strong coupling superconductivity in the system that's different from the standard uh, BCS story. For example, the coherence length in the system is of the order of the interparticle distance, uh, whereas in, in a normal BCS superconductor, the coherence length is usually a lot larger than the interparticle distance. This is again an indication that a large, a significant fraction of the particles pair, not only the ones close to the Fermi energy. Another thing is that the superconductivity seems to not care about increases in density of states. In fact, it is killed by, uh, it's killed at Fanhoff singularities where the density of states diverge. And that's again, is hinting maybe towards the fact that it's not just something that happens at the Fermi surface. Um, so at the end of my talk, let me kind of get back to the main questions I posed at the beginning and just summarize what we have learned. Uh, so my goal was to formulate a theory that presents at least a plausible, a plausible unified description for the different correlated phases in the system. And I posed at the beginning a few questions. So I'm, I'll try to revisit these questions uh, uh, now with the, with the answers that are presented by the strong coupling theory. So the first question about an effective model, we have found that formulating a real space model that's faithful to symmetries is difficult, but we can write these models based on uh, uh, the field theories for quantum hole ferromagnets in opposite magnetic fields and add antiferromagnetic coupling and add other anisotropies. Of course, for the real system, we should use a more complicated order parameter rather than this uh, n vector, which ignores the spin degree of freedom. Um, the other question is uh, related about the energy scale for superconductivity. And uh, at least our theory gives us an, a scale that's very similar to super exchange. It's also given by the dispersion squared divided by the interaction scale. Uh, the third question was about the nature of correlated insulators. And uh, what I showed you is that uh, rather than being uh, something that can be understood in terms of local moments in real space, it's uh, really a, some generalized quantum hole ferromagnets. For the superconducting mechanism, I propose this uh, skirmium pairing mechanism. And finally, for similar systems, I've shown that at least these uh, alternating twist multilayers are present some generalizations of the system. But of course, I don't want to give the impression that we solved everything. Uh, this, is, this still remains a plausible scenario that uh, may or may not be fully confirmed by experiments. And for this reason, let me just mention the caveats or the stuff that may not work uh, about the story. Uh, one of the main caveats is actually you have large uncertainty about theory parameters. So something like the bandwidth, uh, we get a relatively small bandwidth from the non-interacting model, but once we add interactions, it leads to renormalizations of this bandwidth. And this renormalization depends on a lot of model parameters. So we can actually be in either strong coupling or intermediate coupling where uh, while most of this theory assumes strong coupling, the bandwidth is much smaller than the interaction. Uh, another parameter that's played a very important role in our story is this chiral ratio, the ratio of A tunneling to AB tunneling. And there is again, some uncertainty about this, the, the exact value of this ratio. Different approaches in ab initio give you, gives different results or slightly different results. Uh, and of course, these, these uncertainties translate to the uncertainty in the field theory parameters like this super exchange or this uh, uh, SU2 pseudo spin symmetry breaking or valley symmetry breaking lambda. Uh, and these parameters, as we have seen, were crucial to determine whether actually skirmings will eventually pair or not. And one final uncertainty that's one of the biggest discrepancies between theory and experiment so far is particle all asymmetry. All the ab initial approaches give very small values for a particle hole asymmetry in this model, uh, while the, the experiments are strongly particle, all experiments are strongly particle hole asymmetric. And I don't think there's a good understanding of this at the moment. 
Uh, another problem uh, is the fact that it's likely that physics is very sensitive to a lot of details. And this is already hinted at by the fact that different samples show different behavior. And these details can be strain, can be disorder, can be the dielectric environment. And at the moment, we don't always have a very good characterization of these parameters. And also, for many parameters, we don't really have a good understanding of how they affect physics. Um, for our story, uh, what the implications of these uncertainties are, uh, are the following. So some features seem to be generic, like the, the, the emergence of these correlated insulators, although they are, they are actually still sensitive to strain, but some aspects of Spermian superconductivity story seems to be sensitive to parameters. In particular, uh, I showed you that uh, the competition of energetics between the Spermions and single particle energies, that the difference uh, depends very sensitively on this ratio and depending on this ratio, it could be very close or the single particle excitations could actually be lower in energy than Spermions. One could of course ask whether Spermions remain relevant in this regime and my, my answer uh, is, is yes, it's likely that they will still be relevant because they still have the same quantum numbers as electrons. So electrons can tunnel into skirmions and pair still through this mechanism. Um, but this is, uh, and this is something we are kind of working uh, on at the moment. So it's still kind of uh, speculative at the moment. Another thing is uh, this field theory kind of assumed these very smooth textures and momentum uh, in real space. So we're assuming that our skirmions are all big. Uh, so it's unclear what happens to this mechanism when we consider the limit of small skirmions. And that's also something we are, we are working to try to understand at the moment. Uh, but with, with this summary, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, close my talk by acknowledging my collaborators. So all this work has been uh, done with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Ashwin Vichwanath uh, at Harvard, and uh, also in collaboration with several members of the theory group at Harvard and with the theory group led by Mike Zalatel at Berkeley. We've also uh, benefited a lot from uh, discussions and collaborations with experimental groups, both at Harvard and at MIT. And uh, yeah, the end of my talk, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Aslam. We have uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Anyone has a question, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. is, is, is there a way to um, maybe separate out these two quantum hall anti magnets? Can you like uh, end up pinning one of them and, and just have the other? Quantum ferromagnets. Uh, well, the, the way is essentially the, that's essentially what you do when you either apply an electric, a magnetic field or, or just with interactions. So interactions, I mean, of course, the picture I've, I've shown was something like, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, The picture I've shown was just filling some of the bands, but this filling actually induces gaps. So you end up with, when you fill one churn sector and leave the other empty, you essentially pull it down in energy and pull the other churn sector up in energy. So you end up separating the two quantum ferromagnets. So the, the fact I mean, that just this observe, n plus n minus interaction is going to mean that there's essentially one. Uh, no, uh, so 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 th this separates the two churn sectors. Uh, what I, I don't understand. What do you want to separate now? Uh, so if you want to separate the two churn sectors, the one that feels positive magnetic field and the one that feels negative magnetic field, this is the way to do it. So uh, what what do you want? Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was uh, some way to like expose the pieces of your effective field theory in some regime of the system. Yeah, so of course the point is if you whatever perturbation you you induce will will actually uh, will change these parameters. But there is a way to to expose the the field theory if you can if you can measure the collective excitations. So in a ferromagnet you have uh, magnons and uh, the the dispersion. Uh, the, the, the curvature of the dispersion at small field will give you the stiffness. So this is one theory parameter. And then these small anisotropies of the field theory like J and lambda, these actually give you gaps to some of the Goldstone modes. 
So you can, uh, if you can measure the, the, the spectrum of collective excitations, like the Magnon spectrum, you can actually determine all these field theory parameters. And we have, we have some paper, I didn't, I didn't get into it, but we have some paper where we kind of mapped completely the, what soft mode dispersion you expect from field theory. So you can just fit, fit the different parameters you would get from experiment to these theory parameters. Did this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, sounds, that sounds nice. Thank you. Well, maybe there are no other questions. Uh, oh, there is a question in the chat. Um, can you put the reference to the paper that links theory parameters to experiment? Ah, OK. Uh, let me try to access the chat now. Uh, OK, just give me a second. It's, uh, it's, it was in the archive last September. Uh, I'm just trying to access it. I'm somehow having problems accessing it. Uh, yeah, one second. Uh, it is. Uh, This paper. Um, okay, any other questions? Yeah, perhaps perhaps not. Uh, hopefully they, they got your link. Um, yeah, so I'll close the meeting. Look forward to seeing you on campus as well. Yeah, me too. And thank you for arranging this talk.